Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, microarrays. Let me change the display settings real quick. All right, so anyway, this was a really big hot topic um, for research in uh, when I was going through a PhD. It was kind of like becoming a big deal. It was really the cutting edge um, near the end of my PhD. And so it was something that I was really interested in. And the reason why I was so interested in it, it is a tool that allows us to screen literally thousands of genes, expressions, and organisms. It's not unlike um, next generation sequencing that came after microarrays. Microarrays are actually before next generation sequencing. Are you familiar with that at all? Well, next generation sequencing is a way for you to sequence a genome or a big chunk of a genome for its gene expression or a variety of other things. Before that, we had microarrays. And so this picture here is supposed to represent a microarray slide. A microarray slide is can, it can be pretty much just a microscope slide, a glass slide that you've probably seen before. But on the slide, you'll see lots of little dots. And those dots are usually um, segments of single-stranded DNA or RNA that we can use to look for genes of interest. So let me get into that so it makes a little more sense. Okay, so... And historically, gene expression patterns were traditionally studied by using a technique we call northern blots or northern blotting. This is a technique that's been around for quite a long time now. It was a way for us to measure gene expression, uh, a gene of interest by running RNA that we extracted from an organism, a bunch of cells we ground up, purified the RNA, looking for messenger RNA transcripts of interest. And so we would label it with a sequence that would correspond to that DNA. And then it would glow on a, on a, uh, on a piece of film. And if the band was big, then we knew that that messenger RNA was probably um, present in, in high amounts. The problem with that was that technique was very labor intensive and often it was easy to mess up. So maybe you could measure four or five genes you were interested in, and it would take you 24 hours or more to screen it and analyze it. And then you, and then the results could be kind of iffy. It was kind of, it was kind of relative. So again, you could hybridize this messenger RNA that we extracted from an organism to DNA that was on this gel, and then put onto a, a film, and then it would glow. So this is an example of a gel. Again, you would run it through electrophoresis, which would mean you're pulling you know, the DNA across the gel. Then you would take the RNA that you purified, put it onto this film. It would suck up the DNA, and then you would let your RNA float around in it. And if it stuck and glue, glowed under a light, then we knew that that gene was there. So it looks kind of smeary in this picture here. But here's an example of four or five different lanes. And then these would be bands representing genes of interest. And then this would be the size of it. So we'd have like 8.6 kilobyte, or you know, I guess it'd be kilo something. I've never actually done a northern blot. Sue did some, I'm gonna work with her on some projects. But you can see that these are all different bands. And so this bigger band would mean that that, that that gene was expressed more in this treatment than in another treatment. And it was all compared to what we call a housekeeping gene. In this case, a housekeeping gene is a gene expression of a gene that is always expressed regardless of the treatment. So let's imagine we're looking at cancer um, cells versus healthy tissue. And we know that gene A is really stimulated in cancer cells. Well, then you would see that it would have a much bigger band for that. This is, let's just pretend like this is gene A than this one, suggesting, or this one here, suggesting 
that it's really being stimulated in the cancer treatment. See how much bigger this band is compared to that one? You could say it was double. But how did we know that we were using the same amount of RNA or whatever? We use these, what you call housekeeping genes. And again, um, this would be a gene that we always see present in cells. One of them is called actin. You remember, have you ever heard of the word actin before? So that's protein that's inside cells, right? It makes protein filaments. So that would be, and so you see how the bands are all the same size. So that would mean to the researcher that we use the same amount of RNA from the cancer cells and the healthy cells, and that we didn't bias our research because the action was the same level. And now the genes that are different had a different size band. It's because these were all like, this is like normalization. So we used the same amount of RNA. So now when this band is so much bigger and brighter, we know that the, that this, this gene was particularly stimulated in the cancer treatment in my hypothetical scenario, while the healthy tissue wasn't stimulated as much. So anyway, this was the way that we try to measure gene expression and try to get at whether or not this gene was important for a particular treatment. So the problem is here I am studying all these genes and I'm spending investing huge amounts of energy and time to get at maybe one or two or three genes. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to look at thousands of genes and screen thousands of genes at once? Maybe we get a, a network of genes that are important in the cancer treatment versus the healthy treatment. So microarrays were developed with it because we had the ability to make large databases of cDNA. This is just like a copy of DNA. Com you know, that's and this is what we're talking about. So the this allows you to look at a wide assortment of genes for a particular physiological treatment, or it's cancer versus healthy tissues, or in my case, it might be plants fed by, on by caterpillars with salivary glands and without salivary glands or aphids versus caterpillar. I can do all sorts of experiments on, look at the gene expression of thousands of genes in a plant because of microarrays, because we have the cDNA library for that particular organism. So the neat thing is it's kind of like allowing me to do tens of thousands of Northern blots. If nothing else is realized, again, when we talk about gene expression, we're talking about messenger RNA transcripts that are made during transcription. As you can imagine, cancer cells are going to transcribe different genes than healthy tissue. Wounded plants are going to transcribe different genes than non-wounded tissue. There's all sorts of different types of microarray chips that have been out there, but most of them that I ever worked with looked like a glass slide that you would see under a microscope. And we had special robots, <laughs> not like something from Star Wars, but we had the ability with a machine to print tens of thousands of spots onto a microarray chip. So each one of these squares represents literally hundreds of genes. And each one of these chips can represent literally tens of thousands of genes of an organism. Most of it was printed with single-stranded DNA of genes of interest. So again, this is because we were able to take the library of genes from an organism. And, you know, because, you know if you have, like you, you have 10, what, humans have around 20,000, 30,000, more or less, genes, plus or minus 5,000 genes. We have around 35,000 genes or more. We sequence the human genomes. Now we can put each of these genes on a chip, a little sequence, and find the unique part of that sequence for that particular gene. And that each one of the, and you can't see it very well, but on the square, there's lots of little dots representing a particular gene. And you'll see, we can zoom in and look at that a little bit in a moment. So these are these molecules are called probes, and they're they're done through PCR amplification, and then there's 
glued onto this glass slide. This was an example of the robot machine that used to make cDNA microarray chips. They've, um, I don't know if microarray chips are really made in the high abundance anymore, to be honest with you. This was a chip that was made in a lab in Arizona. So this was the, this was the robot that we had in Arizona when I was at the University of Arizona. Basically, there's um, little pins on this that suck up the DNA from these PCR plates, and then they take it over to a glass slide, and then they tap onto the glass slide the genes of interest. And so they would make hundreds of chips, and then they would sell them to researchers. So over in Arizona, corn was a pretty big deal. So they used to make corn microarray chips or maize microarray chips. Then there's a lot of companies that got into it and made them too, like Agilent. And so what they would use is kind of like what you would see with, you know, if you ever remember printers that are inkjet printers, they could literally spray paint chips with these genes of interest. And they literally could have really small spots representing these genes. This actually, this buttons here are like emergency safety buttons because this machine would go in there and people are putting their heads in to try to do a few things. And so if, they're, if their tie got caught and they got pulled into the machine or something like that. So you, you push on these buttons and you could save your, your research assistant from certain death. <laughs> so here's the, they're like little quill pins. They come in here and they suck up solution of the DNA and each one of these wells would be a different gene of interest and then they'd come here and they literally just tap onto the glass slide dropping little droplets of DNA of each particular gene. So again here's what the pins look like. They look like little quills that suck up the DNA and then it gets tapped on the slides back and forth so they make literally hundreds of slides. And so here you can see the droplet uh, DNA that's being added from the pin. It's, it's, it should be like this, but it's angled to the side. We'll, we'll look up a YouTube video on it in a little bit to see if we can find one. But here's a glass slide, and then here's a, a square with lots and lots of dots. And so then we would now, so now we're gonna purify this RNA from an organism. We want to, and we call those targets. So if I purify the messenger, we're gonna purify the RNA from an organism. And then we're going to label the RNA with a color dye. So let's say we have a cancer treatment versus the healthy tissue treatment. I'm going to essentially spray paint all the RNA green for the cancer treatment and all the healthy tissues, I'm gonna spray paint red. Then I'm gonna place them onto these chips and then if they have the right sequence, they're gonna stick. And then we're going to see them illuminate with a laser. You know, I'm making a simple analogy that that's, I get into more about how that happens in another part of the conversation. So here is an example of um, what we, we used to do this all the time, actually, did a lot of theses with this. So let's say we had the plant treatment that was wounded and the non-plant treatment that was healthy, you would have a red and pink. So we labeled one red, we labeled one blue, and then we put it onto the slide. And again, if you're a little confused, it'll make more sense by the time I get done with it. We could put it on a slide and then we can see how red or blue it looks. So again, the treatments were either cancer or non-cancer or plants wounded or not wounded. We purify the RNA from them. We label the RNA. We put it onto the slide and then we're gonna see where it sticks, what genes are most prevalent. And so here's how we're doing it. Here we have a, a droplet from our treatments from the RNA we purified. We put it on the glass slide. We're going to put a cover slip on it, just like you would with the microscope slide. 
and then we're going to put it into a falcon tube, close it. The falcon tube has a little bit of moisture in there, and then we wait overnight for it to hybridize. What do I mean by hybridize? It means that the string, single strand of messenger RNA is going to line up with a single strand of DNA based on its code, like AUG, remember all that stuff? It's going to, seek, it's going to stick that way. And if it doesn't stick, it's just going to get washed away. Again, don't freak out too much if you're a little confused. I, I got a nice little video that'll help you to understand. And so here you can see that the probes are on the glass slide. They've already been made by that robot. And then the target DNA that I've labeled, either red or green, is what I got from the treatments, the cancer or the non-cancer, the plants, whatever. Then we put it into a microarray scanner, and we have one in my lab. Actually, we have two of them. Um, we slide it into this little, in this particular microarray scanner, we slid it into this a slot, the slide, and then there's lasers in here that are red and green that can then fluoresce the spots. We get pictures like this one. So these are the spots. Can you see the spots here? So we, we run the green laser, and we run the red laser, and we put it together, and then we see an image that has reds and greens. So if under my hypothetical situ situation, the healthy tissues are the red spots. So that means those genes were important for the healthy tissue and suppressed in the cancer treatment. The green spots are representing genes that were turned on in the cancer treatment but not in the healthy tissue. So you can assume that all the green spots might be important in regards to the cancer treatments. And then all the red spots were what were stimulated in the healthy treatment, but repressed in the cancer treatment. So it allows us to now say, oh, look at these 100 genes or so are important in the cancer treatment and not in the healthy treatment. So it's a quick way to screen it. And how do I know what these different Genes are well. We have when they put when they made the chip, they knew what that that spot A had was gene fifty nine sixty seven or something. I, this is all make you know the numbers are make believe. Or spot two is protease inhibitors, and the protease inhibitors were stimulated high in the wound of treatment, but not showing showing up at all in the non wound of treatment. So we get an image kind of like this. So if you don't see spots, that means that that gene wasn't really being expressed. In the blue treatment, there's not much there going on there either. But the red or the green, we know those are important in regards to the treatments. If it's really bright yellow, that means it was stimulated in both treatments, irrespective uh, whether it's cancer or non-cancer, plant wounded or not wounded. So like this one, is it more red? Well, in my hypothetical situation, then that was important in the, what, the healthy tissue or the non, it doesn't really matter, right? You just know it's the opposite. So one's the green one, this one's really stimulated in the cancer treatment. The red one, it's really stimulated in the healthy tissues. And we can determine to what degree, because we have computers that scan and then tells us how bright that spot is. And then we can do statistics on the spot brightness. So again, it allows us to measure thousands of genes. So here's basically, again, kind of summarizing everything we've talked about at this point. We have all sorts of DNA clones that have been some molecular biologists amplified all this, um, made this genome, put it into these wells, they amplified it, and then they printed it using these pens, or the robot prints it. Then you, as the researcher, purify the RNA from the cancer cells or the healthy cells. So the cancer cells would be the test treatment in this example. The healthy cells would be the reference. Our wounded plants would be the test. Non-wounded plants would be the reference. 
or moving the plants with salivary gland, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can imagine all the different experiments. We've purified um, the RNA through, there's different ways that we can do it, but we can make cDNA, which is the complementary strand from the RNA. And while we're doing so, we can label that strand either red or green. I'm not going into a lot of detail. It's just um, reverse transcription. You don't familiar with that at all. And then, so whether or not you fully understand it, just realize we purified the RNA, we either labeled the RNA or labeled the DNA, and then it's either red and green. We're going to put it onto this slide, hybridize it overnight with the cover slip in the Falcon tube. Then we're going to pour it onto, and then we're going to run it through a scanner and all that stuff. And then that tells us what genes are important when we combine the image. Let me show you a, a cartoon that might help you. Hopefully it's still available. And then we'll come back and finish up on this in case your eyes are like, what the heck is he talking about? Let's see if I can help with that. YouTube to the rescue me. Oh my God. Get back to safety. Let's go back to you too. One second, see if I can find an image to help you to understand what I'm talking about. So let's, let's watch a couple of these real quick and then I'll see if I can find one. It was a really good one though. It's really fun to watch. This animation will demonstrate how DNA microarray experiments are performed. DNA microarrays, sometimes called DNA chips, reveal the expression of thousands of genes on a solid surface, such as a microscope slide. In this example, we'll use yeast as a model system to illustrate one use of microarrays. One common use of microarrays is to determine which genes are activated and which are repressed when two populations of cells are compared. So again, going back, we'll go back to this in a second. Again, it's not just two, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but remember I said cancer versus non-cancer. Well, in this particular example, so we're using cancer cells, we're gonna use yeast. Um, let, me sure I'm, let me make sure I'm still. We're gonna use yeast that's under an oxygenated environment and under an anaerobic environment. So aerobic environment versus anaerobic environment. You guys remember what yeast does when it under an anaerobic environment? What's that process called? Fermentation, right? So we're gonna have, so there's gonna be different genes that the yeast can survive in an anaerobic environment versus an aerobic environment. And so the microarray chip in this case is gonna let us to see what 
genes are turned on or off in regards to these two different treatments. Just like we could, but could, like I said, going up to cancer versus non-cancer, moon implants versus non-moon implants, it's the same kind of basic idea. But in this case, the example is yeast. Every gene is measured simultaneously. As an example, we'll compare what happens to yeast genes when cells are grown in aerobic versus anaerobic conditions. The cells grow. So here there's no oxygen, and here we have oxygen. And then they're going to divide and under those two environmental conditions. So and adjust which genes need to be activated or repressed in order to survive. Now it is time to isolate the mRNA from both populations of cells. The cells are spun in a centrifuge. Now that the cells have gathered in pellets, we remove the liquid, but not the cells. Next, it is time to extract the mRNA. The liquid was just a growing medium. A from the cells. When we add the extraction buffer, the mRNA is released into the solution. Now realize this is actually a much more laborious process than just putting some buffer in. But what we, we but we do something like this. We may we will do something like this in the lab where you'll get to purify some RNA. Next, we remove the RNA and place it in a fresh tube. Now, let's make the cDNA from the mRNA. Here we see three of the many mRNA molecules from each tube of... So there could be literally thousands of messenger RNAs. We call them poly, poly A RNA. Have you heard that term before? When we're talking about eukaryotic organisms, the R messenger RNA has a poly A tail. And so anyway, they're saying there's th they're showing example of three. Uh, remember, this is five prime to three prime. Hopefully you remember a little bit of this in, in cell molecule or something like that. So this is single stranded. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make the double strand by making using cDNA in this example. However, each one of the cDNAs, when we, label, when we make the complementary strand, each of the, I think it's the uh, C nucleotide has a dye, either red or green. I, can't, I think that's how it's done. Of cells. Each mRNA is converted into red or green colored cDNA. When the colored cDNA is made, the mRNA degrades. So that means they get rid of the RNA and they just keep the dyed DNA. You see now how it's got this, the poly T tail now? So it's complementary strands. Now, they're not going to have the same messenger RNA in these two different treatments, right? Because one was in the aerobic environment, one was in, but some of you will have the same. Then we combine the red and green cDNA, mixing both colors into a single tube. At last, it's time to look at the DNA microarray. In our experiment, a microarray or DNA chip contains about 6,000 spots. Each spot is a different yeast coding sequence from a different gene. Let's choose three spots at random to follow in detail. So, you know, the words, obviously there's what 6,000 spots on this particular chip, but they're only looking at three to keep it simple. We have gene 127, 26, 19, and 58, 54. And so the spots are going to, the the cDNA is just going to float around and it's going to stick if it has the complementary strand because this is all single stranded and the cDNA is single stranded. Each spot is made of DNA that can base pair with its complementary cDNA. Here are partial sequences from each of the three spots we are observing. Now, let's incubate the mixed cDNA with the DNA chip. That's in that falcon tube. For the sake of our example, we'll zoom in and show that some of the labeled cDNA have bound to the DNA in the spots and formed base pairings. Here we see green and red cDNA bound to this spot. Only red cDNA is bound to this spot. And only green cDNA bound to this other spot. In a real experiment... I don't think the word only is right. More of the green is sticking to the spot more of the red that means that under the anaerobic environment red was stimulated more whatever you know not to get tongue tied between which treatments but you would not see any of this detail you would only see the original microarray 
Now we must wash off the unbound cDNA to see what is bound to the microarray. Let's detect the bound cDNA so it can be visualized. We begin by placing the microscope slide containing the microarray inside a scanner. And I have a scanner just like this one. We'll examine the next phase of the process, keeping our focus on the three spots we've been following. First, a green laser scans the microarray. The resulting image is stored on a computer for later analysis. Now it's time for the red laser. This image is also stored on a computer for later analysis. So you can see that this one didn't show red, but this, these two spots showed red. So that means that this gene wasn't really um, being transcribed in the anaerobic environment or whatever. Analysis. Now we move to the analysis phase. After we eject and safely store the microscope slide, we retrieve the red and green images from the computer and create a merged visualization. So those two images, the red and the green, come together. Notice that this one is red, this one is yellow, and this one is green. So what that means is that this gene was really turned on in, was the red the anaerobic environment or the aerobic? I can't remember. But either way, it doesn't matter, right? You just realized it was turned on in one treatment, irrespective of what's one. I can't keep track of it. The green was only turned on in the aerobic and treatment, or, or anaerobic, whatever she's going to tell us in a second. The yellow was equally turned on in both treatments. So that means that this particular gene, 2619, probably isn't particularly important in regards to the treatments because it's equally stimulated. But this gene is really turned on in the aerobic environment or anaerobic. This gene is really turned on in the cancer environment or the wounded environment. So that's a way for us to know that this gene is important for the test treatments or whatever we call the test treatment. It doesn't have to necessarily be red or green. In fact, we do dye reversals for everything because we want to try to cut out all the biases that we possibly can. So we'll, we'll replicate this three or four times and do an, a statistical analysis to say whether or not that gene is turned on and by how much. In the merged image, we see an aerobic gene labeled in green, an anaerobic gene labeled in red, and a gene labeled in yellow that was expressed in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. The one thing she doesn't show you is that you're also going to have spots that don't show red or green. So they're not being turned on at all. This is one example of how DNA microarrays are used. In an actual experiment, quantitative analysis would be conducted on all 6,000 genes. Have statistics. So I thought that was a cool tool and it was being really, so it was really first, um, the reason why they talk about yeast, it was actually um, a yeast lab that really got the microarray stuff going. Let me swap a slide. It was really a yeast lab that got the microarray technique off the ground. I mean, and then that led to a lot of researchers using it for all sorts of other areas of research. So you can imagine cancer people were interested in using it as a tool. It got into the plant insect herbivore field primarily initially through a guy named Ted Farmer out in Switzerland. That's where I first really heard it being used in looking at the gene expression of wounded plants. And so it was Ted Farmer. And so I'd seen his paper. I saw his presentation. And his presentation was, uh, or his paper that were published in Plant Cell, which we consider a very prestigious journal. They published differential gene expression in response to mechanical wounding and insect feeding in Arabidopsis. So that's where they first did microarrays in regards to plant herbivore field. Remember, Arabidopsis was an important plant when it comes to plant genetics. It's a little weed. 
And so when I ran into him uh, back then, I was really motivated uh, PhD student. I said, Hey, can we come out and visit you? Me and Sue went out there and worked in his lab. This was actually during, I guess, what's um, 2001? When was 19? Was that when 9 11 happened in 2001? So we were out, me and Sue were out in Switzerland during 9 11. That's our experience for 9 11. I went out there near the tail end of my PhD program because I sold the idea that, hey, I got this surgery. I can do caterpillars and burn their spinnerets. And we, I can go out to Switzerland and I can we can put them on your Arabidopsis plants and do the microarray. We'll have a pretty interesting story. So I sold that to them. So me and Sue got to live in his apartment and run around Europe and Switzerland and so forth, go to some conferences. It's pretty cool because it's a high, pretty um, high-speed lab, and it's Europe. So they're, you know, on Fridays they would party hard, and then they would have work hard, and then party hard. They'd have their little coffee breaks, and they'd have a little wine and cheese at the end of the week. I thought it was really cool. They were also it was kind of interesting. Their buildings would have uh, plants on top of it. So this is a university. And you're like, where's the rest of the buildings? Well, they're really spread out. And they were even using um, herbivores to mow the lawn as part of their environmental efforts. So I went out to Switzerland and I tried to burn their caterpillar, um, pierced rapey, rapey, or anyway, that's the uh, cabbage butterfly. Here you can see its eyes. So I was trying to cauterize the spinner because that was the technique that I had got involved with, but it wasn't working very well. So that's where I actually did the surgery for the first time. I, out of trying to figure out something to work and work successfully. So I, for the very first time is on this caterpillar, I decided to cut a hole and pull out the salivary glands and, and healed it. So that caterpillar was with them without salivary glands. So that's where I invented the technique was in Switzerland, the surgery. And then we put them on the Rabidopsis plants and we were able to get some results. Here's myself over there. And these are the Arabidopsis plants. Here's the caterpillars. We'd collect them in the field. I would do the surgery. And then we put them on the plants. So anyway, we had the plants wounded with and without salivary glands. We purified the RNA like you heard from the, the movie, cartoon movie or whatever. Then we purified the messenger RNA. Then we would do complementary strand of the DNA and label it either green or red. And so the red color, or I think the green color is Psi 3 and the red color is Psi 5. Now here's to make, it, this is to make things even more confusing to you. When you label it Psi 3, and I told you it's the green color, you know, it's been a while, I might, I might be a little, I'm uh, confused, but it literally looks red, but it scans green. <laughs> so it does the opposite of what you think it's supposed to do. The cDNA that was Psi 5 looks green, but it scans red. <laughs> this is to make it more confusing for you. And then we, then we take those two images that we scan, color, overlay them, and then we can use the computer to analyze what genes might be turned on. And so like these black dots represent genes that were turned on irrespective of the treatment. And then like a green would represent genes that were turned on in like the, you know, caterpillars with salver, with, with salver hands or without, it doesn't really matter. And the red was the opposite. I can't remember exactly the details. So I did that for a short period out there. And then I sold that story to do that at the University of Arizona for my postdoc. A postdoc is a lot like um, after you get your PhD, you go off and do research for a couple, two, two or three years. And then from University of Arizona, I came here as an assistant professor. And so, again, they were big into corn microarray chips, and so that's why we worked with corn. It was really cool to be out in the desert after being a Midwest guy. Outside, I got a little tired of not seeing uh, green. <laughs> It's always blue skies there too.
But anyway, this would be an example of a microarray chip that we had scanned. And we saw a lot of drought genes being turned on and so forth. So that's kind of where, that was the kind of the story about how I got into microarrays. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and then I'll share a little bit of the research that I've done with this. All right, so we'll get back on track at about 5.05. Okay, so I talked about microarrays. So I was just going to share a little bit about some of the research that's been done in the lab, then I'll try to give you a more formal presentation on it. Um, again, um, we've been looking at gene expression in plants. We've been looking at gene expression in insects in regards to each other. And so we tend to call those genomes and, and gene expression or transcriptomes, excuse me. So when you're looking at transcription on a massive scale, we call that a transcriptome. Well, now we're looking at plant transcriptomes and insect transcriptomes, and we're looking at the caterpillars and insect interactions with each other. So we're looking at the genes that are turned on inside the caterpillar as a result of feeding on the plants. And we're looking at how the plant stresses are being altered as a result of the feeding. And so we call this an interactome. <laughs> This is, uh, that's where that term came from. And so we have a lot of interesting work that this needs to be published, actually, or, or interesting enough. We've had lots of people um, go through my lab, our lab over the years, and they've all, a lot of them been on, have had very successful careers. Just lots and lots of students have come through here. Some of them you might still remember, like Mary Anison was one of my master students. So she's now teaches here, as you know. Um, these were some of my first students. Um, if anybody took one of my classes, this is Yaw Awuzu, who's now Yaw McDonald, and she became a dentist, owns multiple dentist practices. And uh, very, I'm sure she's very wealthy. And Henry Lee became a sports medicine doctor, pain relief doctor, making lots of money. Um, she became a pharmacist. Um, he became a medical technologist. Um, he's a PhD now at, at University of Iowa, last I saw. And then this was our son, who's now 19 and running around Western also working on his junior year at Western right now. And I don't know, he's in law enforcement and criminal justice. I don't know where I messed up. <laughs> but he's also um, on his way to probably becoming an army lieutenant in the next year. That's what he wants to do. Anyway, um, and then here were some more students that came through another batch. She was a um, successful in the pharmaceutical industry. He, um, Ben Boda, he ended up going to work for Pfizer. And he was, you know, it's obviously an army of people involved in the making of the vaccine for COVID. And he was one of the, the multitude that were involved in. Maybe not the one that, you know, was key, but he might've been involved in some stuff that was for mass producing it. Because um, it takes an army to get that out there, right? Not just one guy in the lab figure out how to make the vaccine. Um, and then this is Amar. He was one of my favorite students. He's now, he's back in Iraq and he's working as a researcher there. And then um, this lady here, she has her PhD or, or almost will have her PhD from North Carolina State University. And she was a really good student too. Like, so anyway, just had lots of different students. This guy became president. <laughs> had a pretty successful career also. So there's lots of different people. Lots of people became veterinarians. She became a veterinarian. She ended up getting a PhD and is a postdoc now. So, so I've already showed you this slide before, but and this is kind of a diagram of plant defenses and all the, you remember how we showed you the jasmine pathway being turned on, but 
obviously there's just lots of different chemicals that could be affected. Like here's hydrogen peroxide, pathogen related proteins and so forth. Anyway, so we've done all sorts of different things where we treated plants with chemicals and then we measured the gene expression of important defense genes like polyphenol oxidase. Polyphenol oxidase is a substance that basically combines proteins and form, makes them so they don't really work very well. So it binds up protease inhibitors and stuff like that. So if you treat the plant with jasmine, the hormone that, that stimulates plant defenses like those anti-nutritive defenses, in red, you can really see that the protease inhibitors are stimulated. But things like um, salicylate doesn't stimulate it. That's a purple. But interesting enough, when you treat them with the plant with both hormones, you'll see that there's kind of an intermediate or some plant responses get even stronger, like acidic endochitinase. But don't worry so much about what those do. Just realize those are some of the things we've looked at. Obviously, I talked about caterpillar spit on tobacco plants and had all sorts of students that really talked about that. But anyway, we could use that technique and put them on tobacco plants. And this is one of my best students of all time, Brittany Dahl, who was Brittany DeRocher. And she's now the director at uh, McDonough District Hospital over here. She's in, in charge of the entire clinical lab. And interestingly enough, she got her master's degree here. And just last year, she got her MBA as a, something for fun to do on the side, I guess. So she wounded caterpillars, or excuse me, she removed caterpillar salivary glands or left them intact, put them on tobacco plants. You remember we talked a little bit about this the other day. And then you wounded the tobacco plants and then we could measure the gene expression. She purified the RNA. She did cDNA synthesis, labeled the RNA, and then ultimately put it on microarray chip, just like we talked about today. And I've had lots of other students involved in that as well. Here's a microarray slime. This is the Mar and Faisal. We used to have lots of Saudi students come through us. Uh, Mar is from Iraq, but Faisal's from Saudi Arabia, the students from Saudi Arabia. Obviously we have an African student here and uh, Sue's in the back. So we've had a lot of African students and Middle Eastern students, but we don't have as many Middle Eastern students lately. But here's a microarray scan that took place. This is the scanner and here's the microarray chip. So each one of these grids has around, I think it has at least 20,000 spots. So we can scan each of these different things and do an experiment. So you can literally do, so this is like doing four microarray chips on one slide. So this is kind of neat, all the different things we could do. And then you could see the reds and greens and that would be turned on as a result of caterpillar spit or without spit and so forth. Or maybe we're looking at fruits and looking at what genes are turned on in the insect. We just all sorts, we did, did tons of different experiments. And then we could sort out the genes. Um, we eventually went to red and blue because I think that was what was kind of considered more politically correct because some people have difficulty seeing red and green. But each one of these lines represents a different gene of interest. And we could see the different genes that were turned on as a result of caterpillar spit or not spit and so forth. I, I talked a little bit about that, but now you understand the background a little bit to it, yeah. So before, like the, uh, the red and green thing, but that that's not a micro right? This is this is the results of a microarray. Um, just to step back on it, so this would be the microarray, and these are the spots, and then these colors kind of represent those spots. Just but put in what we call a heat map. I should have probably take a moment to, since you brought it up. I should take a moment to make it more clear. So like each, you can't really see the line very well, but there's a line that goes all the way across, just a single little line where I'm following. And it might be green here, red here, and red here, or blackish. That would be a gene. There would be another gene. So there's literally 4,500 genes here. So you're going to see that in the case of mock and ablated, these genes apparently were suppressed by caterpillars with spit. 
these genes were apparently stimulated by caterpillars without the ability to spit because they're blighted. The non-wounded here, these genes are really suppressed by the mock saliva, but not by the ablated. And, and so forth. So these are kind of things, both of these sets of genes are kind of stimulated by wounding. And green is suppressed. That's So heat map just gives you kind of an overall impression of general themes that we're seeing. So you're seeing lots of genes in the mock and ablated down here are kind of similar. And even here, they're kind of similar, but here they're not similar, representing 40 or 50 genes or more. I don't know what the number would be. And then through lots of this grinding it out and Googling it, she was able to sort the genes out into different categories. And sometimes you can just tell, like if it says photosynthesis gene, you know it's a photosynthesis gene. So that's how she gets an idea of that 8% of photosynthesis related. In most cases, those would be suppressed in the wounded treatment. Plant defenses were typically stimulated in the wounded treatment. That makes sense to everybody? So again, that's what that microarray allowed us to do. And then we can go in and, and look at genes of interest, like here's an acidic chitinase. It was equally stimulated in the caterpillars with salivary glands or without salivary glands. Um, but some genes like this one, basic chitinase was stimulated in the mock treatment, the caterpillars that could spit, but not in the ablated treatment. From there, we can do another technique called quantitative real-time PCR and get at whether or not those genes are important in a more fine detail. And so like basic chitinase was really stimulated by the mock treatment or defensin was really stimulated by the mock treatment. We haven't really talked about qPCR, but hopefully you understand a little bit about PCR. We can get into a little more detail about that, but it's a way of measuring gene expression in real time. And we'd punch holes in leaves and we'd, we'd see similar results. So if you painted on salivary gland extracts, defensin was really stimulated in comparison to the water treatment, which would represent the ablated treatment. So again, this is the follow-up to the microarray. And you usually do want to follow up with something like quantitative real-time PCR or measuring some type of protein. That gives you more validity to your results. So really this big screening technique is just really the first step. It's not the end result. We want, to, we want to find out what genes are interesting and then we go and study those more carefully with this other technique. So anyway, this is, you know, we looked at different caterpillars on plants. Um, this was done by Warda. She did some really good stuff. And here's the microarray chips again. So we did tons and tons of microarray experiments. Here we are wounding plants to simulate herbivory, painting on saliva, doing a microarray chip. And then we looked at, again, this represents those, this is again another heat map, but now it's red and blue instead of red and green because we thought it'd be easier to see and so you can see that the mock treatment, these genes are really stimulated in comparison to the non wounded treatment, or these genes are really suppressed in comparison to the ablated treatment. This was in tomato plants. And then we can look at genes that were really of interest. So like here's an, a, a plant defense called acid phosphatase. The mock treatment really is stimulating that. So the wounded caterpillar spitting mm -hmm really stimulates that gene, acid phosphatase, up to 12-fold higher than the non-wounded plant. And four times higher than the ablated. See here, C3. So the ablated caterpillars that couldn't spit stimulated acid phosphatase three times higher than the non-wounded plant. But the mock treatment, the caterpillars that could spit, stimulated it 12-fold. Does that make sense, everybody? And so the different letters represent statistical differences. So the, this means that this is statistically higher than the mock, than the ablated treatment. Or remember, um, well, this is all sorts of them. Here's polyphenol oxidase. You remember me telling you about that one? That's a plant defense. And it's stimulated quite a bit more by the mock treatment than the ablated treatment. 
even though they're, they're both stimulated pretty high. Now, does it, what does that really mean in real life? It's not completely certain, but it does seem like the caterpillar spin increases that the plant defense more so than the ablative treatment. So it seems like spit helps trigger it a little bit more. Here it's like 62 fold versus 45 fold. Or here's something that was really seems to be altered by spit. Acidic chitinase is really stimulated by caterpillar spit. And it is actually suppressed by caterpillars that can't spit. So something about the spit stimulates this gene. And so the next question is, what does this gene really mean for the plant? So you'll look in the literature, maybe you do something, knock out that gene. So it's basically endless. <laughs> and so we were lucky enough to um, publish this work. Here's some qPCR work. So we saw that the mock treatment really stimulated polyphenol oxidase or really stimulated arginase or really stimulated acidic endochitinase. But the mock treatment does that. This was qPCR. So we published this work in uh, the Journal of Chemical Ecology. We've done other studies where we looked at all sorts of other microarrays and we did what we call meta-analysis. So we look at all sorts of other people's gene expression work and try to get an idea of what genes are being altered. Again, I'm just giving you a broad overview. I'm not gonna, maybe some point later, I'll give you more details. But we start to see things like tomato plants really stimulate certain plant defenses that we don't see other genes being stimulated as much. So here we're looking at maize plants, arabidopsis plants, tomato plants, aphids, trees. Photosynthesis genes tend to be suppressed in herbivory. That's why it's blue. Again, I know you don't you can't get the full feel for it. Um, even I that did the work can't get a full feel for it, but we published a work in the journal of, uh, well, we published it in a book and then it got published again. So we've done all sorts of experiments looking at how the plants, the, caterpillar, the uh, caterpillars respond to the plants. Um, did I already talk about this one where the caterpillar feeds on each other? Did I talk about this at all? Okay, let me go over this one a little bit more detail. This one's a little more humorous. So we're interested in how caterpillars respond to plants. So we're gonna look at the gene expression that's altered in plants. We're gonna look at things like tobacco plants and maize plants and so forth. Well, I had a student who was interested in how nicotine altered the caterpillars uh, cannibalistic response. So cat these caterpillars like to eat each other a lot. Do plant defenses trigger cannibalism more than, I mean, what triggers the cannibalism? Why do they choose to eat each other? Is it because of some poisons in the plant? <clears throat> Is it just because they're cannibalistic? Is it because there might be low nutritious qualities in the plant? What are the things that might be triggering that behavior? So this student, his name was Linus Gogg, he put caterpillars in a little Petri dish with cubes of diet. We know that nicotine is harmful to caterpillars, particularly the Helicoverpa zea. And I think we should try to do this in this lab. I think it'd be fun. So we had caterpillars and uh, feeding on a cube of diet with and without nicotine. Okay, so what do you think is gonna happen first? If you put caterpillars on and they get to eat nicotine, do you think their body's gonna grow faster or slower versus an artificial diet without nicotine? So we're looking at a cube of artificial diet with and without nicotine. What do you think is gonna to happen to the caterpillar's growth with nicotine and without nicotine? Yeah. Uh, it's be slower with nicotine. Exactly. That's what I would hypothesize as well. So he put them on a control diet, low nicotine diet, and high nicotine diet, and he watched the caterpillars feed, and that's what his little cartoon is, the caterpillar. 
And what you're, you're right, the caterpillars that fed on a diet without nicotine control treatment had significantly higher body weights than if they fed on the low nicotine treatments or the medium or high nicotine treatments. So they definitely grow worse when they feed on nicotine. So do you think the caterpillar would be smart enough not to eat a diet of nicotine if they got a choice? So here's a caterpillar has a choice between a Cuba diet not treated with nicotine or treated with nicotine. What do you think they're going to prefer to eat? What's that? Exactly. That's what would be our hypothesis. And sure enough, they fed on the control diet more than the nicotine diet. In fact, when they eat the nicotine, they get kind of irritated. <laughs> but this is where um, Linus takes his research off the rails. Here's the, the, the this is a Petri dish. Here's um, two caterpillars. One diet has nicotine in it. Here's two caterpillars. One diet has control. Now what's going to happen? Are they just going to share the food equally? Or are they going to maybe take a munch of each other? They don't like the taste of nicotine. That's the experiment that he designed. Sure enough, the rates of cannibalism increased by at least 25% when nicotine was present in comparison to the control treatment. So cannibalism is very low in the control treatment, but very high in the nicotine treatment. Here they are munching on each other. And then he did some things like where we, we took a microwave chip that we'd gotten from Germany. And we did experiments and I won't go into the details about how the chip was made completely, but it was a really nice chip. And he could look at the gene expression of these caterpillars feeding on nicotine, tobacco, or an artificial diet. He can look at the gene expression of the caterpillar. And so here's the how he set up the experiment. Here's caterpillars feeding on tobacco plants. Here's caterpillars feeding on control diet. Here's caterpillars feeding on nicotine. Then he's going to purify the RNA from the caterpillars. That's what this is showing you all the different steps to purify and make an microarray. And then he sees that there are genes that are overlapping in the caterpillar. So like these genes are probably important being suppressed because of nicotine and the tobacco equally, the blue ones. While the control treatment, those genes aren't being suppressed. However, here's genes that were just not being suppressed by nicotine, but were suppressed by other factors related to the tobacco plants. Yeah, this is a heat map, but we're looking at a, a broad scale of 7,500 genes. And then he can pick, hand pick some genes out of here and do qPCR. So those are the kind of things that we did. So here's qPCR and all sorts of stuff. We did lots of heat maps and so forth, wrote book chapters and yada, yada, yada. My research became so famous they even named a street after me in Nevada. This is right outside the state capitol in Carson City, Musser Street. So if you drive over to Carson, Nevada, right in front of the state capitol, you'll see Musser Street. And that was my great honor that they bestowed upon me. <laughs> well, the, I don't think it had anything to do with me, but anyway, there is a street called Musser Street over there. I don't know why I'm saying I don't think, and I know it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, like I said, there was an interesting time. We had lots of different students, very diverse lab. Um, we don't have Saudi students anymore, um, but it was a learning experience, and I really enjoyed having them in my lab, these students in the lab that were from Saudi Arabia. All right. So anyway, you got it just a little bit now with some of the ways I used microarrays. And it was a big chunk of my our research for the first, uh, well, I guess 12 years at least here, 15 years maybe. Well, anyway, lots of papers I need to write up and publish up. So anybody have any questions, thoughts, comments? Do you, have, do you think you have plenty to do right now? 
it'd probably be pretty fun to re replicate that experiment again with the caterpillars. I'm going to see if I can get some caterpillars and we can make some diets and maybe we can look at um, their behaviors. Does that sound like fun? Okay. Well, you all, you all have a good one. Remember, there's, uh, there's no class on Thursday. So please just work on your assignments. And, and, uh, and then I'll look into getting some caterpillars that you can dissect or do some experiments and nasty things too. <laughs> Does that sound like fun? But maybe you could help design the experiments. That's what the goal will be.